Welcome, everyone. This is episode 266 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's show is sponsored by Omnipod, Dexcom, and Dancing for Diabetes. You can find out more about the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor at Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. You can see what's going on at Dancing for Diabetes at Dancing the Number Four Diabetes.com. And to get your free no obligation pod experience kit from Omnipod, that was the link, myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. There's also links in your show notes and at juiceboxpodcast.com. Once in a while, somebody has to go over and above to be on the podcast. They use their phone at an airport waiting for a flight. A person has sat in their car in the summertime with the air conditioner off so that the sound would be good. Talked to Tommy on his way home from the endocrinologist. But Stephanie, Stephanie really went over and above because Stephanie recorded almost the entire show before I had a mechanical failure with a computer. And then she started over again, even though her life had gotten crazy. So this one's gonna be a little interesting for you because there's gonna be background noise sometimes. Once in a while, you're gonna hear Stephanie driving. You're gonna hear children playing in a playground behind her, but it all makes sense. And I believe that the situation that Stephanie is in while she's recording goes to her story. All right, I'm going to give you this rich tapestry of emotions and sound and feeling information right after I say, nothing you hear on the Juicebox podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your medical plan or becoming bold with insulin. Okay. Um, Arden's asking me about lunch. I'm sorry, I have to... She's like... She says, I'm not that hungry. So I'm like, what do you mean by not that hungry? <laughs> I think it's going to be like the story of our episode. Yeah, this one's going to be, <laughs> this one's going to be interesting. <laughs> so while I'm doing Arden's lunch, let me put everybody's mind in the right place for this episode. I've recorded, I think, about 280 episodes. You haven't obviously heard them all of this podcast. I've had no mechanical computer failures uh, during the recording ever. And Stephanie and I were probably about 15 minutes from being finished recording her episode when everything froze up and crashed and did not flash save the way it was supposed to and the way it's set up to. So we're going to start over again now. Um, but now as we're starting over, we're up on the time where I'm like, oh, I know. I, I was like, this one will be perfect. I'll finish right as I have to do Arden's lunch and everything. So now everything's a little hodgepodgey. In the time, Stephanie has left her son Lincoln, his preschool, where she hangs out outside to help manage him while he's there, and driven home to give the dog groomer the German Shepherd. She is now headed back to the preschool. Are you back yet? Almost. Almost. Stephanie's going to almost <laughs> back to the preschool. And then I'm going to finish up Arden's uh, lunch here. And then we're going to start speaking again. And we just need to get that out of the way because I, I didn't want you to feel weird like you had to talk like you hadn't said something before. So Start over. <laughs> yeah, we'll just let everybody in on, the, uh, on, on what's going on and, and we'll be able to work that way. So while Stephanie's driving, I'm going to figure out what Arden means by it's lunchtime, but I'm not that hungry. I'm not that hungry. Yeah. I'm only going to have four bites of food. Right. And trust me, the answer I'm going to get back here is going to be unpleasant. I said, what do you mean by not that hungry? What will you eat maybe? And she said, a little, which is obviously a, a designation <laughs> of an amount of food. And that doesn't help. Like snack on, I'm not having the sandwich. Okay, well, you know what? I can, I can work with that. Um, let's temp basil. Increase. Let's go 50%. Hmm, 50? No. I'll tell you why. 95% for an hour. And bolus. All right, I'm taking the sandwich out of the bag. Let me think of what's in there. Not many grapes, but some Milano cookie. One, two, three, four. Four units. There were a couple of little chips, five, six, not the sandwich, banana, seven, eight, nine. Oh, heck. All right, <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to do 11 units. Extend 70% now and the rest over one hour. 
or I'm turn on, I need her to tell me when she's done eating. Tell me when you're done eating. What are you just going to bullish your half of what you would? No. So there's more going on than you know. So oh, okay. as Arden left this morning, I said, um, boy, this day really is messed up. I, as Arden left this morning, I said, hey, you only have 25 units of insulin left in your pump. So it'll get you to lunchtime, which is right now. And what I said was, we'll be able to pre bolus with your old pump. I'll be done recording the podcast and I'll come over. We'll swap the pump out and, and you know, we'll, we'll keep going. Instead of that happening, please take a moment to visit dancingfordiabetes.com. Dancing, the number four, diabetes.com. You can also find them on Facebook and Instagram. Instead of that happening, luckily, I guess, Arden gets to school and decides that it's muffin day, chocolate chip muffin day. Oh. Uh-huh. So those muffins are like crazy that they have at the school. So I had to do a really big bolus just for the muffin, probably like 12 units in total. Mm-hmm. So we did that was two hours ago already. And so I went over and changed the pump a while ago. So we don't need, the, we, we don't need a new pump now. She has a new pump. You don't need the break. But she's a little, I can't tell if I'm having trouble getting the pump site going or if it's the muffin. So she's like 150 and kind of stuck at 150 right now. So in a second, I'm going to find out because the muffin's pretty much gone at this point. We're going to find out if this bolus doesn't get her going in the right direction, then it's a different issue. But we'll. Then uh, she needs a new pump. Yeah, and I don't think it's that way. I, I liked where we put that pump. It's And it's doing well. We've been using it and having luck. I just think that it was a new pump on top of an incredibly carborific muffin was probably. Yeah. That was bad timing. I'm honestly thinking keeping it at 150 is a. Is a hell of an accomplishment, actually. <laughs> right? Yeah, Lincoln's steady at 116 right now. So we'll see if that juice box, that juice box uh, catches up to him in a minute. Do you think he's going to go back up? Oh, yeah. Because he, he, when he fall, like starts falling, he falls fast and hard. And so um, there's many times where we've corrected and we've gotten really dangerously low, like in the 30s. And, and then it's just like a struggle to get him to stay to, at 80. Because I yeah. think it's really hard on your body to like recuperate when you're... The bouncing around it, is tough, for sure. It, it's hard, hard, but at, you know, with him being so little to get his body to like balance back out and, and he doesn't talk. So asking him how you feel doesn't really get you anywhere, uh, get us anywhere. No. Yeah. For some reason, Lincoln has chosen not to talk. So, how, so let's, let's, we're going to reorient everything. Ready? Here yeah, we go. Sorry. No, no, don't worry. <laughs> Everyone. This is Stephanie. Stephanie has, Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie has four kids. Her youngest Lincoln has type one diabetes for about a year and a half ish. Um, he has other um, medical things going on too that we're going to talk about for a second. Right now, he's in preschool, um, and he had a, a bit of a he had a, a, a falling blood sugar was falling really fast. And you gave him one or two juices for that falling blood sugar. I he was on the playground actually, so I just I popped my head over the wall and told the teacher he needed a juice. And she gave him a juice when he was 153 double arrows down because mm-hmm. um, I mainly follow the arrows. Right. And he was 109 double arrows down. So I said, I think you need to give him another one because I don't know if he was running around a lot on the playground. That was like with the basil that probably kicked in at the same time, causing him to, and now to drop. And now he's 160 and stable, but you're expecting to go back up and you're scared <laughs> to put any insulin on that at the moment. Yeah, like yeah. I won't give him any insulin at right now, but if the arrow angles up, I will. You'll think I, about that. I just kind of I feel like a stalker at the school sometimes because I just hang out <laughs> well, so in no, the but, parking lot. Now here's my assumption, right? You're trying to give Lincoln some like normal thing. He's going to go to preschool and have a little bit of socialization and play and have fun and do the things you would have done with him had diabetes not come up. Correct. But you don't have enough comfort with. They obviously, they're a preschool. They're not, you know, they don't have it's any. Not, in, in Arizona, um, the public schools offer a preschool. Okay. So it, so it, but you just don't feel comfortable with their knowledge about diabetes. So he, um, yeah, so he's in a developmental preschool because he doesn't talk. And so he, there's a lot of aides and, um, you know, great teachers and staff there. But because it is a public um, K through fifth preschool or school, they have a nurse on staff. 
but um, the nurse and I did not have a good start um, to him coming on to the school campus. And so our last conversation was not nice. And I basically told her that she needed to stop talking to me and that she never had permission to touch my son or ever give him insulin. And even if he's in an emergency situation, you are not allowed to touch him and just call 911. What? What? Oh, I'm so interested. That was now. the Hold ending of our our last conversation, and since then she's quit. <laughs> Did you make her quit? You know, okay, I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't you that made her quit, but she was probably having other problems as well. What led to her? Um, what led to you guys having that conversation? Um, so up? when Lincoln <clears throat> Lincoln started school in November, because when they turn three, the day after they turn three, they can start school. I planned on staying. At the school, never did I ever intend on, like, just leaving and being like, I'll be back in three hours. Bye. Um, so I just, like, lightly touched up with the nurse, like, how I treat him, which is kind of like, I I just kind of treat as needed. Um, because he's so little, he doesn't talk, and, you know, the amount of food that he eats is, is you know, like what a bird eats all the time. Right. Um, he was, he was 89 and steady when I dropped him off the first day, but I was like, and they were about ready to go on the playground. So I was like, I'm going to give him some applesauce before he goes on because 89 and steady on a three-year-old in the playground is a little low for me. And I don't know how he was going to respond to being at school. Right. <clears throat> so I was watching it with the applesauce and I figured maybe he'd breast at like 150. It went to like 190. 200 and then like before i even knew it he was like 400 like high and so i was like oh my gosh this was so fast but i think it was the adrenaline that like kicked in new new thing big playground lots of kids he was running around screaming and that was like my very first experience with him being in a school with the adrenaline and i didn't know and so i told her i was like i'm gonna go give him a half correction so i just gave him one unit i was like because like, this is a false rise like he's gonna come back down and she, so she was like freaked out that he went that high. And I was like, well, you wouldn't have known this if he didn't have his CGM on. It's just with the technology we know. So now we can fix because I'm pretty sure any other type one diabetic, you know, they either rise or fall with adrenaline. You just don't see it. And so that was the day. Basically, it kind of like I took him home. And as soon as we got home, he was 130 and steady. It, like it was just an hour that it took for him to level back out because it wasn't food. It was the adrenaline. And I wake up at six o'clock in the morning with this voicemail. And it was Nurse Kathy that I wasn't allowed to bring Lincoln back to school. That she's uncomfortable with him being in school with those blood sugars. And she feels that I don't give him adequate care. Oh, uh huh. Because so, wait, uh, because but, he but, jumped up. But you're saying that the applesauce was so, like, so he's at 89. You put the applesauce in. The applesauce has no time, even though it's like like sugar water. It, it, it the jump was so immediate that you thought yeah. this couldn't be from that even. No. Right. Right. Okay. It, and so you I, you got to see something else. You tried. You addressed it. Sounds like you did well with it and came back to a nice number. So, yeah. so she saw something she didn't understand and decided that it was your fault that she didn't, yeah. that she didn't understand it. I got you. Yes. Which I never gave her permission to, like, I was like, I'm not going to let, just hand this, all this stuff over to you and expect you to understand. Like, I, uh, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to, you know, treat him and make sure things are fine. Like, I'm not going to set my son up for failure the first day of preschool. And is it so, your, I'm sorry, was it your intention, this hasn't been long, right? Like, how long ago was this? This started, like, November. Okay, so a few months ago. So was it, was you, your intention back then to find, um, I don't know, like, some sort of, like, a, like, a nice balance with this, this nurse, and to eventually for you to not be the person who's sitting in their car, or were you always thinking, I'm just going to stay here and, and take care of this? What was your plan there? No, my intention was, like, after, you know, giving them um, brief like education classes on how to handle it. Um, I would just stay close. Like th I live like seven minutes from the school mm -hmm. and there's grocery stores and stuff. So I would stay really close if needed. Um, Cause he only goes to school for two and a half hours, right, three right. hours. Like not a lot was going to happen, but if I would call and say, I think he needs a bolus, give him 
X amount of insulin, I would just expect them to do it, but it just didn't work out that way. And so that morning I actually, um, went to the district office and sat there and I was like, I'm not leaving until someone talks to me. Like, this isn't how this works. Like, she can't tell me I can't bring my kid to school. Like, he gets adequate care. Like, he has a good A1C. He's three. And this was his first day. I was, I didn't know how he was going to respond. Sure. Like, in the, it's going to be a trial and error for a few months because I don't know how it's going to work. And um, so basically they said, you know, they're going to talk to the nurse and they're going to work it out with, you know, the district because they've never had a parent that didn't want to follow doctor's orders is what they told me. And because I, I don't want them to follow the doctor's medical plan. And and so w what happened? Because I think this happens to a lot of people. The doctor gives you a pretty basic, like, 15 carbs, 15 minutes correction. Like, those, like, you know, kind of yeah. just, you know, basic ideas. And you went in so, and said, look, we have a way we do this, and I, you know, I'd like to make it happen here. And yeah. that, wow. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Because the medical plan is, like when you go to any doctor, you only correct every three hours, right? You don't stack insulin. And um, you, if he's low, you know, you give him, you know, 15 carbs, you wait 15 minutes, which we all know is either too much or like it takes longer than the 15 minutes to respond to the 15 carbs, depending on what it is. Um, so they had another executive meeting and it was me the nurse and two directors in this meeting and <clears throat> during this break that I didn't take Lincoln to school the nurse called his endo and had like a very um detailed conversation with the team at the hospital and I was really offended and I felt very violated by that because I was like he the doctor doesn't care for my son this endocrinologist has never given my son a shot of insulin mm -hmm. He has no idea how my son responds to insulin on a day-to-day -day basis. The endo doesn't tell me how much to give my son. I make that choice, not the endo. Right. How dare you guys have a conversation with the doctor without me on the phone? Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't know anything. But I think they take that as me being like, um, uh, like disrespectful or argumentative towards the doctor's care. I, yeah, because I didn't, I was like, that's not what we're doing. You're not going to give my son insulin. And that was never like, you're not, and she wanted a vial of insulin on at campus. And I was like, no, he has a pump. I'm not, not giving you a vial of insulin. You know, it's funny. Uh, six months ago or so, Arden started getting treatment for like a shoulder, like a chronic shoulder in, uh, injury. And, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so there was some getting set up with a, a note for gym. Like she goes in the gym. She just doesn't kind of use her right arm while she's in gym. She mm -hmm. said to me the other day, she's like, you know, playing one handed, I'm an incredible wiffle ball player. I was like, congratulations. Uh, but, <laughs> but in the beginning, I guess the nurse didn't understand the orders completely at school. Mm -hmm. And I get this like, like phone call from her and she's like, hi, I didn't quite understand the orders um, from the doctor. And I was like, Oh, what don't you understand? She goes, Oh, it's okay. I know people at that practice, so I called over there and got it all straight. I was like, you can't do that. I was, like, I, was, I was like, it's never. They're never. legally allowed. And I'm like, never do that again. She's like, well, mm -hmm. I was just trying to, I was like, I don't honestly care what you were trying to do. And you might, this may have been the most well-intended thing in the world. I'm like, you don't call my kids doctors and talk about them. Like, mm -hmm. like that's not okay. And I don't know why people would think it would be. You, no, you, you I know. was so mad. And I called the um, American Diabetes Association because I wanted to understand the legal rights, like mm -hmm. of the school and of my son and as his care, like his parent. And they said, because once I drop my school off on a public property or like a government property, the care provider, which is the nurse, is allowed to call another care provider, which would be the endo to have a conversation about my son's diabetes. It's legally allowed. I was so upset well, by it. I don't know if that's, you know, that's fine. Like if that's, if that's allowed legally, it's fine. I still told the nurse, I was like, don't ever do that again. Like if you yeah, want to know too. something, ask me. And if mm -hmm. I don't have the answer, I will find out for you. But mm -hmm. you're not getting involved in this. And, you know, I was like, why? That's such an odd leap to make. I, because you know it, why too, is it, it infers it infers that you don't understand. So she needs mm -hmm. to go around you to the person who really understands. 
Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. we all know in diabetes specifically, you're very much more likely to understand than somebody else, you know, you know. That, yeah. And, so. and that's what I told her. And so this last, you know, this meeting, um, she told me that basically I had only been doing this for a year and that I really probably didn't understand it. And, you know, she had been doing it longer and which um, she was a cardiac nurse. So it's totally different than a endocrinology field. Mm-hmm. And I basically was not very nice. And I was like, I think you just need to stop talking. I'm going to stop you right there. And um, don't ever touch my son, ever. Good for He's you. never, you're never allowed to give him insulin. You're never allowed to do a finger poke on him. I will, I will stay close to the school. I will monitor his needs. And if there's ever an emergency, don't touch him and call 911. And that, that was the end of our conversation. Of your relationship. Know, <laughs> yeah, no, it was done. Third day of school, never again. And, and it kind of, I was really heartbroken. Like, I didn't take him back to school for two weeks. Mm-hmm. It just, like, ripped off so many scabs. And it really, like, sent me in, like, not not a depression, but I was just so offended by the whole process. Like her calling his endo, her saying, I didn't know what I was doing. Like her questioning the care that I gave my child. Like it, like, I'm like, do you know how many sleepless nights I spend watching this Dexcom? Because I don't, I didn't know what it was doing and I was trying to figure it out and learn. And, oh, it, it really like put a dagger in my heart for a minute. Well, sure. <laughs> and by the way, a year with a three or two year old with diabetes is worth 10 years of being a cardiac nurse and understanding diabetes. I mean, because and we all know how well doctors and nurses handle blood sugars when you're in the hospital to begin with. It, you know, right. so that, that's probably her idea coming from a hospital setting, which is like you said, and I, you know, every, <laughs> every three hours we'll check and you know, as long yeah. as nobody passes out, we're good. And that's, you know, yeah. pretty much it. And I told her, I was like, I lived in the cardiac world for a year because Lincoln had open heart surgery when he was eight months old. And I told her, I was like, cardiac is nowhere near comparable to endocrinology. Like, diabetes and Lincoln's open heart surgery are in two different worlds. Like, and, and I'm blessed that Lincoln's open heart surgery was was a very good success and it went well and he recovered and hopefully fingers crossed he won't need another one but i would do another open heart surgery before dealing with diabetes any day hands down <laughs> it's quite a statement. because yeah it, that's quite a statement that, that that's a telling statement it really is i mean diabetes is literally a minute by minute ordeal you know cardiac at least what lincoln experienced you know we dealt with the LASIX and the cardio, um, angio, like we didn't, he didn't have cardio angio, but the echocardiograms all, all the time and the, the constant, um, monitoring of his blood pressure and all that stuff. I would rather do that than the diabetes mm-hmm. any day. Yeah. Well, it's a lot, it's a lot of work and at least there's consistency with some of that other stuff, right? That it, it, mm-hmm. not, not always open to interpretation or I wonder how it's going to go this time. And I do have to say, especially with a smaller kid, the fluctuations are just, it, they're oh, they're, they're never ending sometimes and 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 they really do test your they test your will you, you know what i mean like you're like oh i figured this out and then it changes and you're like Ooh, uh, yeah. yeah right yeah. Makes you, makes <laughs> i you mean the n- the nights where he's like steady and he's like 1 30 the whole night i'm like it was a miracle and the next night it's like alarms are going off every other direction and i can't figure it out and I'm afraid to give him too much of a correction. Right. And, yeah, and as he gets bigger, by the way, like that'll, you know, he puts on body weight and everything like that all gets so much easier. Um, what, what are mm-hmm. your expectations for his speech? Is it something that's you think's coming or is there like, is it a, um, a physical issue or he's just not ready to talk yet? Or do you not know? I really don't know. Like, um, so my five year old Hudson is autistic. Um, but he's like high functioning. He can talk and communicate and he socializes and, um, he just has more like the sensory um, sensitivity issues. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was delayed speech as well. So of course they're constantly checking to see if he has autism or that's a question that's in the air right now. But I really believe that Lincoln doesn't because his cognitive thinking is there. Um, but I don't know if he just, it's a, something that he can control. Like he can't control a lot of things right now, like how he feels or the, sh- you know, the sight changes and the finger pokes or if, if he's just like, no, I'm not talking. Right. And so and, 
I mean, how in your estimation, what's the time frame for you to start getting a feeling for what that is? Or, or do you, uh, is there no way to know? Well, like, with Hudson's autism, mind? I mean, I knew at a year and a half that something was different. Um, Hudson didn't talk, but Hudson was more vocal. Like he made sounds for the things that he wanted. Like he wouldn't say soup, but he would slurp like, <laughs> mm-hmm. I need soup. And, um, like he had sensory issues. So like he didn't want to put shoes on and didn't wear clothes. And like, it was more of that combative stuff where Lincoln doesn't care. And Lincoln can put puzzles together. Lincoln can sit and watch a movie. Lincoln can, um, like do memory and match games. He just doesn't talk. Yeah. So if he was speaking even a little right now, you don't think these questions would be up in the air? Yeah. I, I don't, I don't think that, they would ask me as often as they do if they think that there's, you know, an, a sign for autism um, if he was saying more words. But he just, I mean, he may, maybe says five words. Ouch. Ow. It's one of them mm-hmm. when he gets like a sight change. Um, every blue moon, he'll say no. Mom. He doesn't really say dad. He said Spider-Man three times. And that was it. And that's pretty much it. Like he just does not talk at all. Which Spider-Man got him to say Spider-Man? Was it the new <laughs> one? The Spider-Verse? He was Spider-Man for Halloween, and he said it three times, and then that was it. He never said it again. Well, that did, yes. Did, did that? I have to ask. Was that a moment where you're like, "Oh, he's going to start talking," and then he just stopped again? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was so excited. I was jumping up and down. I'm like, "We're gonna, we're gonna move on from this. We're gonna start talking," and that was it. He never said it again. <laughs> I was like, "You little brat." So I think he knows how to talk. I think he just is like, "What for?" And I do think that maybe he's a little delayed from, like, all the medical trauma that he's been through. Um, You know, open-heart surgery, and then he's had the two procedures last year, and then the procedure this year, and then the diabetes was kind of thrown in all that mix. You know, his poor little body has been through a lot in order to survive. And so what Stephanie's alluding to, and it's not fair to her because we're having two different conversations, one of them it's not recorded and one that is, but so... um, Lincoln had to have out his tonsils and his adenoids, right? That was one. And he had um, so many uh, cavities, I guess, that he had to be put put under for a dental thing, right? Like, I don't even know. I I mean, I I don't know if it was diabetes related because the dental stuff started before we knew he had diabetes. Um, But he just was born with very little enamel. And so his teeth were just like deteriorating in his mouth. But then we were diagnosed with diabetes and then the tonsil surgery and then the diabetes or the dental kind of got pushed back a couple months. And so by the time that um, we could get into the hospital and get clearance through endo and cardiology, um, he had to have four of his front teeth removed and eight root canals. Yeah. And then we we just had another procedure. Yeah, and he just had another dental procedure two weeks ago, and um, it's always an ordeal. Like, we're always admitted in the hospital the night before to check and monitor blood sugar, and then, you know, they take him back and to, uh, put him under anesthesia and do, like, a deep cleaning, and they did two more root canals, so. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Kid, he has been through a lot, honestly. He needs Spider-Man. I, I would, yeah, he, yeah. Needs, <laughs> he needs a Spider-Man in his life. Yeah. Well... Okay, so I'm going to try to like revisit this a little for you because Stephanie did something that I think is pretty great. So she found out um, that she, that her son needed open heart surgery prior to his type one diabetes. She looked around locally, did not find a doctor that she thought was um, was you know the right person to do the job. And tell tell them how you contacted a doctor all the way in Boston. You're way out on the West Coast. I like this idea. I want to make sure that I don't forget to mention the ease of use of Omnipod every once in a while in an ad, and today's going to be that day. This past weekend, my family went to visit our son at college. So, you know, we stayed in a hotel, and, you know, everything was a little kind of packed in and rushed around every once in a while, and you were going from here to there and working out of bags and stuff. So one morning we got up, and I said to Arden, I said, hey, you see there's only like 30 units of insulin left in your pump. We're going to have to change it at some point this morning. But we were going to visit. My son was doing some sort of a run or something, and we were going to see that first. And we thought the pump was going to make it, the insulin was going to make it to lunch. Except that my son's event kind of got stretched out, which led us to a snack. And then all of a sudden, the pump needed to be changed. Arden changed her insulin pump 
standing at the back of like the tailgate of my car and it maybe took two minutes. Like that was it. Had a little cooler with some insulin in it, took the insulin out, filled up the pump, primed the pump, stuck the pump on, pushed the button, injected the cannula and finished. Cleaned up. That was it. We literally did it in a parking lot with people streaming by. I don't think anyone noticed. That's how quick and seamless the process is. If you want to find out more about the Omnipod, you should go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. And at that link, you can ask Omnipod to send you a free, no obligation pod experience kit where you can actually try the pod on for yourself. Now, you don't have to try it on standing behind your car in a parking lot. You could probably do that at your house, but if you wanted to, you could, and I don't think anyone would notice. MyOmnipod.com forward slash juice box. After we were told that Lincoln, you know, it was time for Lincoln to start preparing for open heart surgery, <clears throat> we were given two referrals locally and, you know, good old Google. I did a lot of research on the doctors here and just decided, you know, that wasn't um, the road that we wanted to go. So we picked out three hospitals. It was going to be um, L.A., Philadelphia, and Boston. And Boston being number one because they're the number one um, ca- pediatric cardiology hospital in, in the world. And so I got just enough digging and I did some background search and found this thoracic surgeon's email and I emailed him and, and said, Hey, this is my son. Um, he needs surgery. These are the things he needs fixed and repaired. Um, can we schedule surgery with you? And within like a week he responded back and he's like, yeah, I have July 13th open. And I was like booked. And we just hopped on a plane and we were in Boston for nine days while he was recovering from open heart surgery. That's like Expedia for open heart surgery. Just I'll yeah. just click on this link here and they'll get back to me with their offer. And uh, <laughs> then we'll go forward. That was, that really is great. It, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, a lot, it was a blessing because the surgeon actually only had to do a partial open heart surgery. So he didn't have to open his whole sternum. Mm-hmm. And, um, he was only in surgery for like three and a half hours. And when he came out, he recovered. And I mean, he was only in ICU for um, I think two, like 24 hours. So, and then we just went down to the recovery floor and he was good to go. How long ago was that surgery? July 2016. What's the follow up like for something like that? Do you still have to do follow ups or is he finished? We do. No. Um, so, what they did, Lincoln had three holes in his heart, one of them being very large, a VSD. Um, they repaired those, but the biggest concern was he had, it's called a muscle bundle. So basically like it's all these like fiber endings that kind of make like a web inside your heart or considered like a cyst. And it was blocking one of his valves. So they had to go in and cut into the heart muscle and tissue and remove that cyst and stitch it all up. So the biggest fear was damaging like the electronic operating system of the heart Mm -hmm. and so if they did you know dug too deep or missed a spot i mean he would have needed a pacemaker so that was kind of my fear of finding the best of the best that i could find to remove that and they did but it it can always grow back it could grow back yeah so we get um an echocardiogram done like between 10 months and a year now we just go back to the cardiologist and uh, make sure that you know the holes are staying um, closed and there's no tissue damage there and that the bundle isn't growing back. No kidding. Wow. That's a, that's a lot to go through. And then how long after the surgery did the diabetes pop up? Um, so we celebrated a year, you know, celebration with Lincoln surviving the open heart surgery. And then kind of immediately after that, he started just getting like not acting himself and kind of being sick. And so Um, that was like, I'd say July, August. And then in October is when I think the DKA set in and he was really sick. And so, um, the week of diagnosis, I actually had, um, taken him to five different doctors and just pretty much begging them to look at my son. I took him to the cardiologist. I took him to the ENT, my pediatrician. I even took him to like quick care. Um, and I took him to one other doctor. I couldn't, I can't. Uh, think of who it was, but 
I was like, something is wrong with my son. He's vomiting. He smells funny. I'm like, smell. I would put his face in their nose and I'm like, smell him. He smells funny. He had this really bad yeast infection, which we had never experienced before with him. And just all the telltale signs, like, and nobody caught it. Yeah. And, but but and, back then, you didn't know what those signs were. You were just, I know. You were just like, look, I, my kid's really sick. This is obvious. Somebody tell me what's wrong. Yeah, I I thought, I really thought, because he was scheduled to have the um, tonsils and adenoids removed, that it was just a really bad, like, strep infection or some type of infection with the tonsils and the adenoids because they were so big. Right. And um, he kept having the chronic ear infections. And so, but then I started getting scared that was that infection infecting the heart? And so that's why I took him to the cardiologist and they did like a, you know, their little scan and they're like, no, he's fine. There's nothing wrong with the heart. And so, um, actually Thursday night I was sitting on the couch with them after he just threw up all over the house and I, I go, I got him a smoothie, which was probably full of sugar, but because his tonsils were so bad, he was choking on everything. So I thought, well, at least if we get you a smoothie, you'll get hydrated and get some calories in you because he had lost so much weight and I was just sitting there and I had this like inner voice tell me Stephanie this is bad and your son is going to die if you don't get him help and I kind of like brushed it off and then the next morning I woke up and he was panting he was breathing so heavily he couldn't he stood up and fell down and I was like oh no so I immediately like just threw him in the car and as I'm driving to the hospital, like that just sheer panic is coming over me again because I'm like, Oh, please don't be the heart. Even though we just went to the cardiologist yep. and how am I going to get him to Boston for the surgery? And I get, we we're, once we get to the hospital, we're automatically like put in a room because of his history. Mm-hmm. And, um, the a PA walks in and I told her, I was like, I need you to listen to me. My son is going to die. If you do not help me something, is wrong with him. Yeah. He smells funny. So I go through all these symptoms and like he's vomiting, but no fever. And you know, he's been on antibiotic and nothing's helping. And she's like, okay, well let's run some blood tests and um, we'll see what that says. So the first panel came back and at this point we had been there for five hours and he had been fasting. And she's like, well, that panel came back fine. And you know, there's really nothing. So it's just, he probably just needs that surgery to have his tonsils removed. And I was like, no, like you're not listening get another physician in here. I'm not leaving. Something is wrong. And she's like, okay, well, let's wait for the second panel to come back. And about five minutes later, there were people just like wide eyed, buzzing around the room. And they're like, we're going to do some more tests that didn't come back. Right. And I'm like, and I keep asking, like, what do you mean? Didn't come back. Right. What, what's going on? And you know, you're immediate, immediately thinking horrible things. I'm thinking cancer. I'm thinking like some infectious disease. Like I, I never once did I think diabetes until they checked his blood sugar and it said 310 and I kept looking at them like what does this mean like what is a normal blood sugar what are you looking for and uh, and then like a whole team of like official like big time doctors came in and they're like um your son is a type 1 diabetic and we're admitting him to ICU right now because he's in DKA yeah wow that's it's you got a double extra stressy diagnosis story. I, yeah, yeah, I will yeah. never forget that moment like I was hyperventilating. My husband had just gotten off work, so he met me there. I gave Lincoln to my husband, and I was like, I'll be right back. And I walked out in the parking lot, and I vomited, and I just, like, fell to the ground because I was just like, we just, like, survived open-heart surgery, and, like, we just did all this stuff, and now this. Like, it was so, like, it it knocked me to my knees because I was like, how are we going to deal with this? And That was Friday, and on Tuesday, my son was diagnosed with autism. So in one week, like, our whole world just, like, crashed. (laughs) Even even going back, it's still super emotional because, like, we're just spinning out of control. Everything's just going wrong at the same – and at the same time. So you're telling me that (laughs) a year after heart surgery on a Friday, you find out – first of all, you you go – you're you're running to doctors, begging them to help. Nobody's helping – you finally mm-hmm. say to yourself, all right, I'm going to go to the hospital. You go to the hospital. The hospital tells you no. The whole time you're there, you're thinking, this is something to do with his heart. This is really bad. You know, it's, it's taking you back to the other spot. They tell you nothing's wrong. You persist. They come back. They say diabetes. And and then one, two, three, four days later, your other son's diagnosed as having autism? 
you know, so my son was diagnosed with autism four days prior. Prior. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. So on a Tuesday, my son was diagnosed with autism. And we kind of already knew, like, it wasn't a secret, but just to have that, like, it verbally said to you, your son has autism and has ADHD. Like, he has, like, a bunch of diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And so that's our older son. And then on Friday, you know, meanwhile, while we're dealing with the autism, you know, Lincoln is, like, dying. Like, there's, he's just deteriorating minute by minute. And so Friday, I'm in in the children's hospital, and they say that to us. So, yeah, it was... It it was a rough. I think I walked around in like a cloud for a good month or two because I just didn't know how to how to handle life, breathe, and process all of this stuff going on. Well, I think it's even more impressive that you figured out the diabetes on the heels of the autism because you could have easily said to yourself, "I you know I there's no more here. Like I can't keep looking for problems in my life. I have enough." And and you know. I guess he just was so bad off at one point. You're like, look, I don't care what anybody's saying. He's obviously dying. Yeah. Yeah, no, I knew he was in a bad, a bad place. I mean, just looking at him, Mm -hmm. you know, like the panting and he couldn't hold himself up and like everything, every bone was like protruding out of his body. And, and I mean, it was very obvious that he was, he was dying. I remember Arden, like those in the hours prior, I remember Arden, prior to diagnosis, I remember her like when she was walking, like that feeling like she was dragging herself. Like, yeah. like, like there was just a force field in front of her. Like she could barely get herself to move forward. And then she'd stop frequently while she was walking. Like this was just too much for her. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, yeah, it's really terrible, but you are, I don't want to say, but because it's, that's not something you just give away. I don't think emotionally and, and move forward, but are you having any luck? kind of moving past that part and oh yeah I mean every time you know I think that definitely is you know a moment that I don't think I could ever like get over like being a parent like there's a couple moments in life that that you just look back on that just you know knock you to your knees again um but we're good like we've traveled Lincoln's gone to Mexico we go to California um I've taken him on a couple trips nice um we've definitely mushed forward I kind of hit that rut. Um, nothing was really happening. And I was just really struggling in the summer because I couldn't figure out how to manage diabetes with our hot summers and putting him in the car when it's 110 outside, his blood sugar would tremendously drop. I couldn't figure out the pools. And I was just like so bummed. I'm like, okay, this is not as easy as I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. And um, so I just kind of hibernated in the house. And then um, I took a weekend to go hang out with my best friend in San Diego. And as I was driving there, I was like, I'm going to listen to a podcast. And then that's when I pulled up your podcast. And it just kind of recharged me. After I listened to one episode, I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to go home. I could fix this. I know how to do this now. And so thank you. Yeah, it really um, it just kind of fueled the fire. Right. Like I just needed that community of friends and and even though you're, you're, um, the people that you put on aren't my friends, but it really feels like I have a team supporting me and people's ideas to bounce off. That is very nice of you to say. I appreciate it. A lot of people think their stories aren't valuable, but I'm like, eventually your story will be part of the fabric of why people listen to the podcast and they will get something from it, you, you know, and you, there's no way to, you, you kind of don't get to decide what your story is to somebody else. And you just putting it out there is the best way to go. I'm I'm thrilled that you found it and that it's been it's been this valuable for you. I'm, I'm yeah, really like happy. his. Um, I feel like you know we were through because he had those two procedures, um, really early on in the year last year, right after um, being diagnosed, and so every procedure changed his insulin needs drastically, and so it would take like I don't know three weeks to figure it out, and then we'd get in a good spot, <clears throat> and then he would need a procedure done again and so then or he'd get sick or you know something like that and so it took me a while and so when I found your podcast I think his a1c was like 9.8 which was a lot of work on a little kid that doesn't talk with all of this stuff going on 
And and we just had an endo appointment in February, and he's seven point five. So I'm pretty proud of it. Yeah, it congratulations. Was a, it's been a, yeah, it's been a lot of hard work, and he just had his procedure in February too. So, I mean, I want to get him lower, but I think it's hard with a three year old who doesn't talk, and you give him food, and he falls asleep. So, well, let's say first. <laughs> let's say first of all. Two things. Um, that's a great number, uh, you know, for anybody, not just for your son who, you know, is young and doesn't talk. And, you know, the, that's just, that's a, a fantastic accomplishment. So, um, you know, having a goal of being lower is really going to be about you making like fine tuning adjustments, about him growing and getting bigger, you know, being more communicative, like all the things that it's going to take, you know, to start like cranking that number down. But you're, you shouldn't feel like, you shouldn't feel like, wow, I need to get lower. You should, you know, I think that, I, I guess the way to put it is, is that people always say like, I want to lower my A1C. And I think, no, you don't really, you do, but you don't. You, that shouldn't be your goal. Your goal should be to make small changes that keep your blood sugar from spiking and from falling low so that you don't have to re-add food. Like when you do that, you get better and better at it as time goes on. And your A1C as a consequence of that comes down. Like I always tell people, I never think about Arden's A1C. No, like, never. but you know, I, yeah. And I, and I, I understand that part of it, but it's just kind of like every, a validation that all your hard work is like, it's actually showing and it's bettering his health. Oh, like, I, I feel good when we get the number. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah. In the day, in the, please. But in the day to day management of Arden's like blood sugar, I don't think like I have to do this or her A1C is going to like be something. I just think of, you know, each, you know, a, a spike by spike, you know, just so that blood sugar is trying to go up. Now I'm going to take care of that. You know, we're like, you know, we talked about at the beginning about, you know, doing a pod change over top of a carb heavy thing today. And now Arden's yeah. eating and I'm still being aggressive and we're holding their blood sugar at bay. It's at 180 now, but now she has a full meal in her and, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to do my best to not let it go higher than this. We, we just added more insulin a moment ago. You, you didn't hear it happen, but we're going to keep pushing until we can get it back. Um, yeah. it, I'll get her level again and I'll never think about this moment ever again. You, you know, like right. I'm just going to keep going forward. And if you keep making those addresses, that's how you get to where you want to be. You know, I, I know there are always people who listen and hear Arden's A1C is lower and think that her blood sugar must be constantly, you know, like 85 or 90. And it just isn't the case. It's 180 right now. It's something, you know, timing of something just didn't go well for us today. We're going to get it back no. as fast as we can. That's it. Right. And and I always feel like people always want to know, like, what's his number at? And I'm like, well, his number, I mean, I could tell you, but in a few minutes it's going to change because we're going to go outside or he's going to eat. And, like, it's never about just what it is at that moment. It's looking forward and making sure that in an hour we're still going to be able to keep it balanced or, you know, make minor adjustments because it's not always the number that I'm concerned about. It's the direction of the arrows too, that I really, I really follow. Absolutely. There's a, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the speed and direction of your blood sugar and how are you keeping it where you want it to be? Yeah. And I think every like person's needs are different. Like, um, we just had an endo appointment, which I mean, I don't really understand the whole, I heard you say, you don't know what the whole point of them is. And I kind of feel that way now, right now, like we go and he's like, you do this really hard. What you do is a lot more work. And I, and I was kind of taken back because I was like, well, how else would you do it? Because if I only bolus him every three hours, like he would be all over the charts, but because I give him those micro boluses. So for him, you know, anywhere from 0.10 to 0.5, you know, just these little bits every, you know, throughout the hour, like mm -hmm. I'll do it two or three times as he's eating or as he's playing, you know, on the needs of adrenaline or the hormones or, and I'm like, but how else would you do it? And I'm fortunate enough that I, I work evenings. So when I go to work, my husband, you know, takes over. So we don't really have a lot of caregivers and my father-in-law does it. And we do have some babysitters that help and I don't allow them to give insulin, but, um, I always set him up kind of for success when he's, um, not when I'm not with him and he's alone with someone. I mainly just at that point, you know, have them treat as needed with Lowe's. Can you believe how much help the Dexcom G6 is in Stephanie's life? Between being a three-year-old in preschool and surgery and everything else that happens, just amazing. You heard her say earlier, 
most people's blood sugars probably jump up to 300 and no one ever knows. And how long do they stay there? You know, hours until somebody checks again. But you don't have to live like that with the Dexcom. The Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor can tell you instantly that your blood sugar is not reacting the way you had hoped. Or it can tell you that it is reacting the way that you hoped and provide sort of a comfort and a calm and an ease and an ability to forget about diabetes for a while. No matter where Dexcom is helping you in your life, it will help you. Right now, today, Arden has a cold. It's just a head cold. It's nothing crazy. But she's requiring more insulin. And we've been able to let Arden live her life normally today. And by that, I mean food, lunch, breakfast. Arden's had pancakes today already. Um, it's a day off from school. She's downstairs now working on a little lunch. And even though she needs a lot more insulin today than she normally would, her blood sugar is 140, I'm looking, 146. And it's coming back down a little bit. But it hasn't gotten any higher than that. Now, if I would have just used the regular amount of insulin that we normally use in these scenarios, her blood sugar would be much higher. But Dexcom told me, hey, this isn't working. And I was able to readdress. I implore you, check it out. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Look into the G6 continuous glucose monitor. It's going to be the best thing you ever did. If you can't remember the links, they're also at juiceboxpodcast.com. I can't agree more. I mean, honestly, to call it harder, I think what they're trying to say, what I think that they're saying harder and meaning you're involved more often, but being involved, but being involved less often to me is harder because it's difficult for me for my kids blood sugar to be 300 and then to be 50 and then to be 300 again. Like that's hard. You know, and that's what we were experiencing doing the every three hours. Like, you know, he'd be 300 and then I'd give him a unit and then he would be um, 50 and then I'd be treating the 50 and then we'd be 400. And it just never was like even And even if it's even in 200, you're learning to coast. Right. So if he even is what we're aiming for, not the spike all over the place. Right, and right. that was that I was like, he's never balanced. I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, to me, he's never be, in a good spot. Yeah, right. To me, it's much simpler and less, um, you know, taxing on my time and my thought to see a 130 diagonal up and go, ooh, let me just bump that back again. And, right. you know, and then it would be to just put in insulin, close my eyes, hope for the best, test again three hours from now and see that. Th because it throws you into that horror every time you're like oh geez i did what they told me to do and now his blood sugar is 300 and yeah. what am i going to do because he's 300 but he's going to be hungry again soon so and, and you get into that horrible just that roller coaster ride which really is no better way to say it like you're high and you're low and it's up and it's down your stomach's in your throat and your heart's in your stomach and you know like it's it's always like that yeah you, give me five minutes where i have to say all right bolus extra here let me pay attention to it for a couple minutes, see if it stops the way I expect it to. And if it doesn't, we'll put in a little more. That to me is so much easier and a better way to live, a more delightful way to spend your day. Yeah, you, they you know? feel better. I don't feel, I mean, I feel better when I know that he's in a steady range versus like these spikes all over the place. I mean, I literally start like, if I'm not with him, I'm calling my husband. Did you give him insulin? Did you give him insulin? Give him this much. Give him this much. Like, and I don't stop because it's just like, no, like it's just not going to, it's going to crash as soon as the insulin catches up because there's nothing really backing that rise at that point anymore. Exactly. Just, you're, you're missed. And trust me again, please, as he gets older, as he gets, you know, more body weight, all the things that come with growing, this becomes less and less a part of your day to the point, to the point where it just doesn't, it just doesn't happen the way that you're describing anymore. You'll find a balance. I can't wait. I'm like, come on, second grade. Because you said you started texting Arda when she was in second grade. Yep. And so I'm like, in second grade, I'm going to start texting him and telling him. Because I don't know at this point, like, if I could ever really trust a nurse because they're all going to want to do the three hours. And I'm just like, no, that's not how we're going to do this. Like, And, even, and that, that, even that aside, even if you found a fantastic nurse, they're still going to be in that situation where you're like, well, there's certain times I go to the nurse's office. And, yeah. You know, and so whatever my blood sugar is when I get there is what it is. I mean, like you're looking at what's happening with Arden's lunch today is a great example of how texting is helping. Like we really are in the middle of it's a quagmire. Like it's just there's too much. It's just such a messed up situation. You know, she needs a new pump. 
Um, so we put the pump on, but it, she's already eaten something with a lot of carbs in it. Now we've done a pump change on top of a large carb heavy thing in her system. And we're trying to get it going in the right direction, but it's just, it's, we're not winning the battle at the moment. And before I know what mm -hmm. happens, lunch happens. And so, you know, I thought we were there, we were at 150 and I was like, Ooh, I'm getting it. It's moving in the right direction, but it turns out I wasn't. And then lunch happens. But if I just, if I go back three hours from now and do whatever we did, do you know how much more insulin we've used since then? Like Ar Arden's blood sugar would quite simply be 450 right now if I waited three hours for her to go back to the nurse. A and instead, we're just in a sucky 190 blood sugar that's going to take a little time to get down. It's a huge difference, being com just having that communication. Yeah, and so um, going back to when Lincoln had his dental procedure um, a couple weeks ago, there was the following endocrinologist that came in and she was like, going, we're going over the protocol and, and it's a big battle every time I go to the hospital because they want to administrate insulin. And I'm like, no, he has a pump on. I monitor his insulin. Basically, you're here just to hook up the IV. That's right. why we're here. And they're like, oh, we've never had a patient do this. They always are astounded by his technology, like the Dexcom and the Omnipod, which I'm just like, this isn't like new technology i don't understand a lot of people all. have these <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, and they're like we've never seen someone with all this technology on we don't know how to handle this or the protocol and procedures aren't up to date or current with technology which i find very very frustrating every mm -hmm. time we go and so this doctor came in she's like so if his blood sugar hits 300 um we will take his insulin pump off and give him a shot of insulin and i was like why would you take his pump off? Right. It's probably going to go that high because of the anesthesia. Um, and if it does, I will just bolus him with the pump and then we'll wait and it'll come back down. And she's like, so are you refusing medical care? No, I'm refusing you to take my son's pump off and give him a shot of insulin. Isn't that well, interesting? The pump, could be, the pump could be kinked, she told me. And I was like, but the pump's working right now. Mm -hmm. And if the pump is kinked, I'll just take the pump off and put a new pump on. No, you're not, you're not taking his pump off. She'll, she got really frustrated with me. And she's like, so you're refusing medical care? I was like, if that's what you want to call it, I'm refusing for you to take his pump off. There's no reason for his pump to come off. Feel free to call it whatever you want. And hey, I'm refusing to accept your, under, your misunderstanding of why my kid's blood sugar might go up. Isn't that amazing? Right. Like if the blood sugar goes up, she leapt right to a mechanical failure of the pump is the answer. Not yep. of all the bazillion things that could happen to push his blood sugar up. Yeah, I'm like, he's going to surgery with dextrose running through his system. So, yeah, it, and, they, and they always, like, decrease when he goes in for a procedure, decrease insulin, or they shut it off because they don't want, you know, it to do anything while he's in there. So, yeah, when, when he actually came out of the procedure, he was, like, 89 with an arrow angled down. So I was like, you need to get that dextrose on him now. Like, mm -hmm. he's going to drop really quickly. And so with that running through a system and we weren't really bolusing, we were just letting the basal run in the background because I don't know how dextrose is good. Like, I don't know how much to bolus for that. So he did hit 300 and I gave him, you know, a small correction, not a full one because I wasn't, I don't know what, there's nothing in his system that's really causing this high. And it was just the anesthesia and the dextrose and probably the, you know, trauma that his mouth just went through. Yeah. And she came back in and she's like, should we give him a shot? I'm like, no, he's going to come back down. It just takes, it takes time for insulin to work. You should know this. Like, and he had all that dextrose running through his system. Like, he's okay. Like, and I don't want to force him to have to drink juice again because he just had a procedure done, like in his mouth. Let's just let it be. And he was fine. Yeah. Like he came back down and everything was good, but Every time I take him to the hospital, I get this like pushback about his technology and the Dexcom and the insulin pump. And I feel like I'm, you, you know, you have to really advocate and real and not argue, but, you know, be smart about it and just say, no, we're not doing that. Or no, why question, why are you doing that? One time I took him in, he was 75 because he was vomiting and he kept vomiting like four or five times in one day and 75 and I couldn't keep juicing. The lady came running in to put on an IV fluid. And I was like, no, you can't give him that. He's like, he's 75. If you have sugar dextrose, yeah, you can put that. But you can't put, you know, saline on him right now. She's like, he's high. I was like, no, he's 75. Like, if you if you give him that, you're going to bottom him out in 30 minutes flat. Well, it's just, it's mind boggling to think of all the different misunderstandings that you've, like, witnessed. And these people, yeah. these people have enough power over you. 
to then say, well, go ahead and tell me you're refusing medical care so I can chart that you're refusing medical care. Yeah. yeah. And, and like, and it's like, but you don't understand the technology. You Like you're not understanding me. And I all, and like, I'm afraid that if like, if there's ever an emergency and my husband had to take him because my husband never really does, you know, he, he usually stays home with the other kids or he's working. Um, I do all of the medical stuff mm-hmm. or the doctor stuff. And the that advocating, something, yeah. And the advocating, he just he just says, yeah, whatever she said, because she'll kill me and you. So do what she says. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, um, oh my! And you think he would just go with the medical people because he wouldn't have another basis for understanding? He would think, well, I got to go with mm-hmm. them. I don't know. I think he would. Yeah. He was like, oh, they said hook him up for an IV, so they know, and he'd let them do it, and. And where I'm like, no. And I think I told him four times, no, you're not giving him fluid until his blood sugar is over a hundred. Like it's 75 and he's, he's three. Like he doesn't talk. Getting him to eat and drink on command is not possible. And he has been vomiting all day. So if you have that extra fluid running in the background, I know what's going to happen. That water is just going to, you know, drain him. So I think the biggest thing of dealing with a chronic illness is just knowing your child or yourself and knowing that advocating for yourself is not necessarily being wrong. Right. No, you have to, you absolutely have to stick up and, and speak up. I want to, mm-hmm. I want to, I know we're at the end of the hour and you've basically spoken for an hour and 45 minutes now. So I, <laughs> I appreciate that, but I want to just check on you sort of at the end here a little bit. Are, how, yeah. are, how are you doing? Do you stop and think about yourself? Or are you just going to see how long you can keep all these kids alive before you drop dead? What's your plan? <laughs> no, um, you know, I still work and, and I really love what I do. And I think that is like, I, cause I'm a hairdresser. I've been doing it for 14, 15 years. Um, and, and I get to go and socialize with my friends, basically people that I've done for a long time. And, and I think that is, I mean, it's my saving grace. It's my escape. And, we do, my husband and I do, do like we switch weekends, like, Oh, this is your weekend to go do a girl's night. This is my weekend to go do a guy's night. So yeah, we do a lot of mental escapes. Like, um, even if it's going to the movies by yourself on a Saturday, like we, we do give that each other that break because it, it is, it's, you know, men- mentally exhausting and especially managing, um, four kids and two of them special needs is, uh, it's a lot, and it's a lot of battling. I feel like I'm always I'm battling a doctor. I'm yeah, battling somebody. a school. Yeah. yeah, and I'm just like, when is it going to be easy? But, you know, I feel, I'm, I feel like I've always kind of been a warrior in that sense of where I just don't do that. I don't go left because you said go left. Good for you. I'm, I'm glad. Are you excited about, you, have, you said you have Dexcom and you have Omnipod. Are you excited about the idea of them working together and making oh, some decisions? Oh, I am so, I am so excited. So, I do. I did sign up for Dash, so I'm waiting for that to come out. Um, and we are just now upgrading to the G6 transmitter, so um, I'm really excited for that. But yeah, I'm ready for Horizon to come out. Because um, you went to the Phoenix Summit, right? Um, the JDRF Summit. I did. I went out and I spoke. I spoke three times in six hours at the JDRF Summit in Phoenix. I know. Did you? I, I think I'm, I shook your hand when um, I first walked in, but I felt like I was stalking you because I went to all three of your... Um, How did I your, do? Let, let, let's, you let's did really good. Me. Did I? Yeah. You know, I feel like for you, it must be really challenging because so many people want to ask you questions. Like there was one lady that just went on and on about a cure. She was just like so frustrated. And I, you kept trying so many times to be like lady, I can't help you with a cure, but I can help you with your blood sugar. Like, do you want to talk about your blood sugar? But but I can't help you with a cure. And I was like, can you stop talking and taking up his time? Like, we're not, we're not gonna talk about a cure today. Can we talk about like blood sugar and basil? Behind the scenes about that? This will probably not get me invited back. But (laughs) so we're in this, I'm sitting on a panel. My first one was a panel, right? And we were there to answer questions. And so, you know, somebody raises a, 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 a hand and if you go to enough events like that, you'll see that there are some people there, they just really want to be heard. Oh. And there's no, like, they're, they're not following along with what the room's there for, what the people are there for. They just, they want to say what they want to say. So she wanted to start, you know, chirping about, I was promised a cure and it's not, you know, like that. And so she kept, you know, you think at some point, okay, they're going to get it and they're going to stop and you're going to move on and get to everybody else. But she wasn't giving up. 
So no. I don't know if you caught me, but I leaned over to the person who was next to me on the panel and I whispered in their ear and I, I said this, one of us is going to have to stop her. Is it going to be you? Because if it's not going to be you, I'll do it. Oh. And, and she's like, no, no, I said, okay, I will. And it, you just have to know how to, so I kind of, I hate to say it, but I just kind of spoke over her a little bit and stopped her and then yes. took another question to get it moving again. But she did chew up. It, th that's the problem with those things is that the time's not enough. And so yeah. you, this was, um, you know, this was a situation where you had an hour to ask four people questions. And mm -hmm. it would have been nice to let all the people answer their, as many as you could. Instead, she chewed up a lot of time. My problem then in the next settings is that in 45 minutes or an hour, the stuff I'm really there to say, it, in fairness, takes an hour or so. Plus, then it invites questions afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I'm always talking incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, sometimes the further you get away from the East Coast, and you're speaking quickly, you go south, you go west, people are like, hey, calm down, buddy. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I got to get a lot out here in a, in a short amount of time. But but I am glad you, so I'm glad you liked it. I, I really am. And thank you for coming. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I went last year and last year I felt, um, it didn't really, I felt really bummed that I wasted my Saturday going because it didn't really apply to little kids. There was nothing geared to little kids or just how to treat, you know, how to change or, you know, treat basils. And, and this year I felt like with you being there and then, um, I forgive me, but the guy that did the triathlon or marathon. Yes. I forget his name. Yeah. Right. He no, was no. there and that was exciting to hear his accomplishments and stuff. So I think this year they did much better. And I was really happy that they had a lot of inter like pediatric endocrinologists there because last year they did not And I was just like, well, what's the point of me being here? Because none of it, it was like, send your kid off to college. How to do sports? Like, None of it applied to having a type one toddler, yeah, not I one, one here. thing. Yeah. I was like, what's the point of us being here? Well, but, we got a lot of great <clears throat> feedback. Um, I know I got good feedback on my stuff and, and the JDRF has gotten back to me and said, they've gotten good feedback about the stuff that I spoke about while I was there. So I think they'll, um, I think that, you know, hopefully they and other, uh, you know, chapters will think more about letting people leave with real actionable tools, you know, not just like, mm -hmm. you know, like, Oh, you know, we talked about encapsulation. Well, that's great. That's 15 years away. If they cure, if they figured it out today, encapsulation is 15 or 17 years off or something like that, which is fun to hear about for five minutes, but not for an hour. And, no. and you know, like people need something they can take home with them and put into play, you know? And so yeah. that was my pitch when people asked me to come out. I was like, you know, what I tell them is I'm going to, I'm going to speak about stuff and give people a real chance to make an impact in their health and their life and their happiness and everything. And, and, and not be so afraid. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the doctors, I mean, and the, this just may be like, like you say, like the don't die advice, but they really like impound you with that. And it's so like fearful when you get home, you're like, I, I don't want to be responsible for killing this little kid. Yeah, and, right. and, and, but and when you, you don't, but you still need to understand how to use the insulin. You can't just throw your hands up and say, well, well, I guess whatever happens happens. And so, yeah, that's that. I had a great time. I I told them immediately. I I thought they ran an amazing uh, event. I thought it was incredibly well um, uh, set up and and organized. And it ran great. I said I'd be thrilled if you want me to ever come back. I'd love to come back again. I thought they I thought they did a really great job. I was also equally as impressed uh, with Southwest Ohio. Man, they have they really do something great out there. Um, do they? Yeah. So you know, I'm up for anything. If you're interested in having me speak reach out. I would love to. No, it was, it was awesome. And I really, um, I liked that you were there because it was a different spin on what was available, what was speaking. And so to have, have you out there who's not a doctor and you're not a diabetic, but you're a caregiver. And that's what a lot of those people are. We're all caregivers right? and, and we're here and we don't know what to do. Like we're constantly like looking for the next best advice or yeah, next it's, idea it's great to hear from other people and see what they do too and see if you can't incorporate some of it into your plan so yeah I, I and completely it, agree. the one thing i do want to say to parents out there that have a non or that are non-diabetic wear your son's cgm or your child's old cgm for a week to see how a non-diabetic blood sugar works because when i did that it totally changed my perspective on diabetes mm-hmm because people's blood sugars do go up. <laughs> they do go up right. and they go really down and like it bounces around. And I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Well, if I'm, I'm healthy, I don't have diabetes or pre-diabetic and mine is mine doing it. So, I mean, I went to 150 eating yogurt. And so now I don't really eat yogurt anymore because I'm like, obviously that's hard for my body. But 
just to see how it changes and how I like if I can change and feel things like um, I went to like 60 all night one time when I was sleeping and I was like, oh, and I'm fine and I'm alive. And yeah. so if he's 75 and he's low sleeping, he's OK. It's like it's I don't really need I can shut the basil off for you know a little bit and let him go back up. But I don't need to wake him up and correct it and make it go to 150. Yeah. Knowing, knowing what you're talking about goes a long way to doing something. It, it really does. And it, yeah. that's a great way to do it. I've heard a lot of people say that and I haven't had the opportunity to, but I would certainly, if I could get a hold of the technology that was extra, I would love to see that, you know? So Yeah. His was getting ready to expire and we had a new one. So I had a week left on it and I just downloaded the Dexcom app on my phone. I was like, okay, I'm going to try it and see what happens. And I was such a little chicken when I had to insert it myself, but <laughs> I did it. And it's good. easy to put it on someone else, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had a count. I was like, okay, one, two, three. Okay, maybe we'll do it at ten. One, two. <laughs> <laughs> That's but oh, well, very thank cool. you, Stephanie. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming on. Yes, yeah, so I thank you, and uh, I can't wait to hear more. All right, take care. You too. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. So Stephanie is obviously a fighter. There's a lot going on in her life, and there was a lot going on this day. I appreciate you guys listening. I try really hard for the sound to be great on the podcast, but I just didn't want to not give you this episode. I feel like what Stephanie went through today, recording the show once and having to record it again now in her car and outside of her son's school, it's just, to me, it, it showed a tenacity that I wanted you to see. So hopefully you could listen through the background noise and, and see what I was trying to show you. Thanks so much to Dexcom, Omnipod, and Dancing for Diabetes for sponsoring the Juicebox podcast. And thank you very much to you, the listeners, and everyone who's supporting and sharing the show. Don't forget this Friday, another episode of Ask Scott and Jenny will be available. If you're not following the show on Facebook, check out at Bold with Insulin on Facebook and on Instagram at Juicebox Podcast. Facebook's really great. There's a really big uh, contingent of you guys in a private Facebook group. So you join the Bold with Insulin group and then ask to be put into the private side of it where there are a thousand people helping each other with questions, day-to-day -day stuff about basal rates and stuff like that. It's very cool. Very communal. I like it. 